Good evening. Going through uh, Acts, Paul's missionary journeys now. That's where we're at. And I know sometimes we can kind of get bogged down in that, but I would uh, get where I can click here. I would, um, we talked about this, uh, part of this in 15, and kind of going through this, uh, the first deal, the Jerusalem Council after Paul's first missionary journey, and then we get towards the second journey. Um, you know, and this is a big, this is a lot, this is a lot of ground. And this is modern day Turkey, if you're not real familiar with the geography. Uh, this is Turkey up here, Russia up here, modern day Turkey, um, the Middle East, uh, basically in here. And of course, uh, Italy, you know, Greece, get up towards, uh, towards Italy up there, Greece down here on the bottom. Um, a lot of area, right? Uh, a lot of country. And, you know, this is going to take a while to do this, obviously. This is by foot, uh, by ship. Uh, a lot of things going on here. You remember the first journey, we kind of just stayed... We kind of just stayed in here, right here, kind of up through here, back through here, back to here, kind of just a little loop. And remember, he went up there, and he talked to them, and he converted them, and then he went back and put elders in the churches, and then he came back to Antioch, and then we had the Jerusalem Council that we just talked about where he went to Jerusalem, and they told him to abstain from, uh, abstain from blood, right, and uh, things sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality. Um, kind of made that compromise back to Antioch which is where we get to when we're going to leave again on the second journey but what can we you know what what do we learn from from Paul on these journeys uh, you know this was a uh, you know I think uh, we talked about the uh, you know Ron talked about the break in this division you know early on you know, way back, of course, back turn of the century, right before the turn of the century, basically right after the Civil War. That's really where things kind of fell apart. Um, you know, and a lot of times we see that division, and, you know, a lot of times people say today, well, it was just the instrument. But the truth is, is the instrument wasn't really what divided anybody to start with. It wasn't the instrument. It was missionary societies. Missionary societies are what really divided the church. Originally, early on, before the Civil War, missionary societies is what divided what divided the body and it really comes back to these journeys of paul essentially uh, a lot of it does um and how our hermeneutics are how do we read the bible um campbell and stone were real big campbell's big thing was speak where the bible speaks silent where the bible silent call bible things by bible names that's kind of the motto that came out of that and if we take that hermeneutic, that way of interpreting the scripture, then it, we limit ourselves beyond going what the Bible says to do. So if the Bible says to sing, then we take that to be sing, not to play. So, but like I said, the instrument's not what divided the church. It was missionary societies. So what happened was is they wanted to send, the Bible's pretty plain, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation, right? He who believes baptized should be saved, he who believes not should be condemned. Pretty easy, pretty big command, right? Pretty simple, right? Pretty, let's just do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so uh, but then the question comes, well, how do you do it, you know? Uh, he doesn't say how to go, right? He just says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, you know, he doesn't say how to go. I guess if he said to ride a donkey into all the world and preach the gospel, then we'd have to ride donkeys, right? But he said, just go. So, but so they decided. So you get this movement going, these churches going, and, and these two groups come together, the Campbellites, you know, the Campbellites, they called them, and the Stones, they, they come together, they're growing, they're getting bigger all the time, and they're like, well, we need to go into all the world, preach the gospel, right? So how are we going to do that? Well, some of them said, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make a missionary society. And every church is going to pay $150 a month to this, which is a lot of money. We're talking about pre-Civil War, right? So this is, this, it's, it's, you know, $150 is a lot of money, you know. And so we're all going to pay so much as a church into this missionary society. And then this missionary society is going to hire missionaries. And they're going to go to these foreign lands. And they're going to 
bring the gospel, preach the gospel, right? Well, so what's the problem with that, you see? Well, there's, once again, get back to our hermeneutic, right? So a lot of churches were like, well, it doesn't say we can't do that. So, you know, that sounds like a pretty good business plan. You know, we'll pool our money. We can pay somebody more money. We can maybe do more because, you know, we'll have more resources and we can, you know, have oversight, you know, and that sounds like a good thing. So, so we'll do that. But then some churches said, oh, but that's not our example in the Bible, right? The Bible never says anything about missionary societies or, or, you know, paying missionaries as far as that goes from, you know, to go out and preach or Bible never says anything about any of that. So we're overstepping, right? So in other words, if, you know, so let's look at what happens in Acts. So this is our biblical example. We don't have a lot of biblical example of church plants in the Bible. Because the Bible's really not about that. The Bible's more about church problems than plants. So we have to look to Acts because that's our history and that's what was going on. So, so we look at Acts and we say, well, how did Paul do it? Well, Antioch, right, was his base. Antioch is who sent him out, a local congregation, sent him out to preach the gospel, Right? Um, so there's no missionary societies, no group. We're not sending all our money to a fund. We're not, we're just, it's just local congregations that did that. So one group says, well, the Bible doesn't say we can't do it. And that seems like a smart thing to do. So we're going to start this missionary society and we're going to, and we're going to do that. And we're going to send people out. But you know what happens whenever you get a lot of groups that are like supporting like one thing like that? is that they never agree. You know what I'm saying? They're all sending money, right? So if you're sending money to something, you kind of want to have a say in what's going on, right? Well, when they started sending this money to this missionary society, they didn't have much say because the missionary society had picked these missionaries and they would send them to wherever the missionary society thought the missionaries needed to go. And so we started having problems. Right? We want to say, if we're going to do it, we want to say. We want to, well, well, it didn't have much of that. So some of the churches said, well, you know, you're overstepping. Bible, there's no example of that in the Bible, so we can't do that. We ought to do it by local congregations have to send out these missionaries. We can't, shouldn't be a missionary society. And the other one says, well, the Bible doesn't say we can't do it, so this seems like a smart thing to do, so that's what we're going to do. That was the start of the split right there. Because the deal was, is all of them were kind of required to send this money into this missionary society. And a lot of them said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to do that because we don't want, that's an earthly organization. It's a, we don't want to plan on doing that. That was the start of the split, uh, what split the church. So really this essentially is a lot of what started that split between, you know, disciples of Christ, church of Christ, you know, first, first, first Christian. That was what really started the split. Now, m instruments came into play eventually, but it wasn't ever the instrument. It was never the instrument, essentially. Really what happened was the Civil War, after the Civil War, things really came to a head, really before the Civil War. Because one thing that happened in this missionary society, so you got churches in the South, you got churches in the North, they're all sending money to this missionary society, right? And... Civil War is looming. Slavery, big issue. Abraham Lincoln's president, drafting people into the military, right? One of those guys that's drafted into the military, you probably know him, uh, is Garfield, President Garfield. Wasn't president then. He was a general in the Union Army, okay? He was an elder of the church. I don't know if you knew that or not. But President Garfield was an elder of the church, Matter of fact, when Garfield became president, he says, I stepped down from a higher office to be president of the United States. So uh, he, was, he was an elder. Before that, he was a general, right? General Garfield in the Union Army. So we got this missionary society. Things are getting heated. Churches in the South, anti-slavery movement's coming. They're feeling persecuted. Churches in the North, they're wanting to abolish slavery. You tell me in the Bible. You tell me who's right. Biblically, you tell me who's right. You see? 
Churches in the South said, the Bible doesn't say anything about not owning slaves. Matter of fact, people in the New Testament own slaves. Right? It says if you own slaves, treat them good. There were slaves in the New Jesus never said, sell your slaves. There were slaves in the days of Jesus. He never said that, right? Matter of fact, the book of Philemon is about what? A runaway slave. And what did Paul tell the runaway slave? He says, go back to your master. Am I right? So churches in the south are like, well, there's nothing um, scriptural about slave ownership. We just need to treat them good. Right? Churches in the north are saying, well, it's not ethical. It's not moral. You need to treat other people how you want to be treated. And would you want to be owned? Churches in the south said, well, a lot of slaves don't want to be free. A lot of them want to be owned, which was true. Well, it was true on both sides. So the missionary society is kind of in the north, north of the Mason-Dixon. And so they're having a meeting. Well, General Garfield shows up in his Union uniform. General, right? Well, churches in the south, they're pretty offended because the Union Army shows up at the missionary society meeting you see what I'm saying? And they're like, we ain't going to have no part of this because you, you know, it's obviously how the missionary society is supporting the North, supporting the anti-slavery. Churches in the South are like, well, we're not going to send money to you because we don't agree with your, what you're doing, right? I mean, we think slave ownership's okay, right? Down here, you know, we're not trying to change it, right? So then the war comes. Well, the war, if you've ever studied the Civil War, it was awful. We killed more people in the Civil War. Do you realize we killed so many people in the Civil War that it took up to the middle of Vietnam before all our foreign wars combined killed as many people as we killed in the Civil War. Do you know that? All the foreign wars up to the middle of Vietnam, all those people that were killed, World War I, World War II, uh, Spanish-American War, Korea, or Vietnam, we was all the way to the middle of Vietnam before we killed as many people on foreign soil as we killed right here in this country in the Civil War. That's how bad the Civil War was. So the Civil War goes on. You heard of Sherman's March to the Sea in your deal, right? General Sherman, he marched to the sea. Remember that? If you ever read that? And he burned everything. Remember that? Burned all the fields, burned all the crops, burned all the plantations. He burned everything in his path. Scorched it, right? Scorched the earth. So they signed this thing, the war's over, but here Sherman has destroyed all these crops, all this stuff, these houses, their land's burned, their crops are burned, the slaves have been set free, the South is in an economic state of disaster, right? The North is booming. The North has had all this industry, they've won the war, their infrastructure hasn't been destroyed, the North is booming. South is in terrible shape. And the churches in the South are looking to the church of the north and saying, help us, right? Because we don't have nothing down here. And the church of the north, instead of helping them, they bought organs. So, it, so the church of the south are like, well, you won't help us, but you're buying instruments. <laughs> so then we got this more of a division, right? More of a division. And then not long after the Civil War, well, 20 so years after the Civil War, you know, we officially said, well, we split. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that, you know, there's a lot that went on. It wasn't just one thing. It was how you look at the Bible. It was the economics. It was the Civil War. It was how brothers treat brothers. It was, it was hugely intricated and complicated how all that fell apart. And it just never could come back. And so you wound up with these southern churches that were predominantly, you know, Tennessee, Kentucky, you know, south, that were predominantly, quote, Church of Christ, right? Southern side, south of the Mason-Dixon. And not, not wholeheartedly, but then north of the Mason-Dixon, you wound up with more uh, disciples, Christian, first Christian. So it kind of became a, and then eventually that, of course, spread across those lines, but but that's kind of how things kind of fell all apart. But a lot of it comes right back to this, right back to Acts. Um, how do we read the Bible? How do we take Scripture? How do we 
Do we have authority when the Bible doesn't give us authority to do something outside of what the Bible does? And, and so it was a big deal, obviously. And the Civil War was a huge part of this, a huge part of it. So, um, so we had this division, and, but it all comes back to this. This is our example. This is our biblical example of how missionaries and church plants should be done. This is it. We don't have anything else to speak of. Gary and I have talked, and you know, like Timothy, he was a ministering evangelist, right? And basically, Paul kind of gave him authority to do things in that body, to point elders to do things, same way with Titus, right? Uh, he, was a, uh, he was a ministering evangelist, and Paul gave him authority to do what? To put in elders, to put in deacons, right? That was about as far as their authority went, to this is how you're supposed to do it. This is how you're supposed to start it. And then you're supposed to back off and you're supposed to let that church govern itself, right? Um, so that's our biblical example of planting a church, basically. You go in, you evangelize, you convert some people, you get an eldership started, and then you back off and you let that church govern itself. And that's our biblical example here of how this works. So, there's a lot to it here. A lot of our history, a lot of church history, and a lot of that kind of melds together in this particular part of the Bible when we talk about how to evangelize, how to plant congregations. Um, a lot of pretty interesting. Something I spent a lot of, of course, you know me, I love history, and I love church history more than I love history. So, uh, very fascinating to me. All this has always been fascinating to me. How we, how we got where we are has always been really fascinating to me, you know. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, any comments before we move on? Uh, so this time, sometime later, so we've done the first missionary journey. We've done the Jerusalem Council. We've moved on to another period of time. Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers where we preached. And Barnabas wanted to take John, that's John Mark, okay? And he's who left him the first time and went back. Paul didn't think it wise because he had deserted them in Pamphylia, had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted companies. So Barnabas took Mark and went to Cyprus, okay? And Paul chose Silas and left, commanded by the brothers, raised the Lord, went through Syria, Sicilia, strengthened the churches. So, so they split because Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, and John Mark deserted him last time. Paul didn't want it. It was a sharp disagreement. So it became Paul and Silas and Barnabas and John Mark. Barnabas and John Mark, they went to, they went to Cyprus. Cyprus. So they basically w did kind of what Paul did. They went here. But on the other hand, Paul's going to go by land. So he's going to go by land. Now, if you remember right, Saul's from Tarsus, right? And Tarsus is right up in here too. So, so he's familiar with this part of the, part of the world. Um, so they're going to go that way. They're leaving from the same place, leaving from Antioch. And so they're leaving from that one congregation. They're leaving from Antioch. This is where we pick up Timothy. Now, Timothy is going to become so important to Paul later on. Matter of fact, Paul calls him his child in the faith, right? Um, this is where Timothy comes onto the scene. So we get, Paul's going to write to Timothy, right? First and second Timothy. Paul's going to write to Timothy. We call them pastoral epistles. First, second Timothy, Titus, and and so Timothy's going to become a really, really close companion of Paul. But this is kind of where it starts. Um, he was a disciple, the Bible says. So he had heard about Christ, obviously. Even though he was there, he had heard about Christ. He was already a disciple. Uh, Paul didn't necessarily, I guess, convert him, although Paul calls him his child in the faith. And a lot of people say, well, maybe Paul baptized him. Maybe Paul had something to do with that. But probably the interesting thing about Timothy is he had a Greek father. Now, that doesn't seem like a big deal to me and you, but to them it was a big deal because Timothy has not been circumcised. Now, 
if you remember right, we had a big discussion about that, right? And we just went through the Jerusalem Council, and that was one thing they wanted to do is be circumcised, right? That's one thing they wanted to happen. We read Galatians where Paul said he w- didn't circumcise Titus, right? He wouldn't circumcise him because he didn't want to give in to him for a minute, right? But here we are with Timothy. Paul's way he converts people in these towns is he always goes to synagogue. That's, that's kind of what he does. He goes to synagogue. He's working on converting Jews because the Jews know something about God. It's a good starting place. You don't have to, you, don't have to, uh, um, you know, Mark says you got to believe in God. Well, well, they already had that one covered, <laughs> right? Didn't have to start there. We already had that one. We just had to convince them that Jesus was God's son. At least we had the God part down, right? So that was good. So Paul would go into these synagogues, and he would, and he would preach. Well, he, he's going to take Timothy with him. And he knows that the Jews aren't going to accept Timothy because we just had this discussion about circumcision. And if he takes Timothy in, into these synagogues, they're not going to be worried about what Paul's saying. They're going to be worried about the fact that Timothy's not circumcised. Like I said, in our society, who would know? Who would know, right? But in that society, whole different ballgame. So he's not circumcised. It's going to be a deal. Because if you go into synagogue and you're not circumcised, you're going to have a lot of mad Jews, right? Because part of proselyting into Judaism was circumcision. That was part of it. If you proselyted into Judaism as a male, you were, went through the mikvah, you went through the baptism, you were also circumcised. That was part of that being a proselyte. So Paul took liberty here. He didn't have to do it, but he thought it was best if he did do it because he didn't want it to be a stumbling block because he tried to preach to the Jews. So Paul takes Timothy and... Uh, And he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived there because they knew his father was a Greek. So basically, Paul is proselyting Timothy into Judaism so he can preach Christ, as odd as that seems. Um, But he takes that liberty. With Titus, he says, I'm not going to do it because you guys think it's such a big deal and I'm going to make a point. It's not a big deal. But this is a different case. This is a different scenario. He was doing this to reach him, doing this so that Timothy wouldn't be a, Timothy wouldn't be the issue. Christ would be the issue. So there was a reasoning behind what he did. With you and me, you know, it sometimes we might be around somebody, maybe something religiously, maybe they have some deal with something religiously. Sometimes we can, if it doesn't go against what we believe, we can go along with that if it means we reach him, and we can talk about that other part of that later you know what i'm saying we don't have to do you know we can use liberty if we have that ability and that's exactly what paul did here even though it seems a bit extreme poor timothy but but nevertheless uh (laughs) yeah i mean as i can't imagine that as an adult anyway another discussion but but anyhow uh it was uh that's what paul did and he did it for that reason so that they would accept him uh, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem to obey. And that goes back to Galatians 2, where Paul travels. Up. Because what you've got to understand here, let's back up a little bit. And I'll, uh, okay, yeah, I don't know what I'm backing up to. Um, yeah, I can't find the map. It is there. I don't know where it is. There it is. Um. So the book of Galatians, right, in the Bible, is not a town, okay? Like Corinth, right? Philippi, Corinth um, are towns, right? But Galatia, the book of Galatians, which is what Paul writes where we was in Galatians 2, there's this area, it's this, it's this, uh, it's this region. This is considered Galatia, Okay? So when Paul wrote the book of Galatians, it was a cir- what we call a circular letter. It was to all those, it was to all these congregations up in here. It was to all these congregations. It was a circular letter. Galatians was to that whole region. That's a region. Galatians is a, re- is a region, okay? And like 
The other books of the Bible, like Corinth, that's a town, right? Corinth or Ephesus or, you know, Thessalonica, um, Crete, you know, those are places. But Galatia is a region. So Galatians was written to like a whole area up there in the top. So it was considered to be a circular, a circular letter. Um, so we get down to this, and that's what they're going to do. Uh, they're going to deliver these decisions, reach the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. Um, the church was strengthening in the faith and grew daily in numbers. They, they passed throughout Phrygia and Galatia, which is where I showed you, Galatia, Phrygia, and been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. So that's north of there. So that's what we, in that time, uh, the lower part called Asia Minor. So Asia Minor and then Asia, so um, which Asia Minor is Turkey today. And it says they came to Mesia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit would not allow them to. They passed Mesia, went down to Troas. So this journey is, uh, is lengthy, this is a lot of walking. If you remember um, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, traveling could be very hazardous right i mean you know jesus told the parable of the guy that got attacked by robbers i mean you were kind of on your own out there so this was kind of dangerous i mean this isn't like what we think this would have been you know when paul says i've been alone i've been cold i've been hungry i mean he was really saying that he had been alone cold and hungry i mean this was really tarred this was tough i often wonder how they ever did it i really do i mean i you know, when we were there, and of course we didn't really go like necessarily where Paul went, but we were in uh, Ephesus, Kutasaki now, Turkey, but Ephesus. And you know, it amazed me how hilly and mountainous that country is. I guess I never really thought about that, but I mean, this isn't like walking from here to Tulsa. This is more like going down in the Kaimishi Mountains down there and taking a hike. You know, it's, it's hilly. I mean, it's hilly, mountainous. Uh, country it's wooded a lot of it's really wooded it's uh um you know where where jesus his time was you know in the middle east right there around judea um you know paul's running paul's literally going hundreds of miles out you know uh out through here so um it's really a really dangerous harsh conditions um it had to it had to really be tough i often think that he so he goes if you read Corinthians, so he goes to Corinth, especially Second Corinthians, he's wanting that money to take back to Jerusalem, right? I mean, that's really what, it, that's really kind of the crux of it. He's wanting to get that money. He's going to take that money back to Judea, back to Jerusalem because of the famine in Jerusalem. And it's always, uh, and I've always wondered, you know, that was probably quite a bit of money to have to take back over land, over to get back to, to Judea. And, you know, that had to have been pretty scary I think that would be a pretty scary trip, carrying that kind of money. And, you know, anyway, just thoughts that I have. Hard to put it in our, hard for me sometimes. I look at this, and then I think, you know, I'm not, I don't do a lot of walking, but I sit here and I think, you know, 60 miles, I would hate to think i got to walk to Tulsa to preach the gospel. I mean, even that would be, that would be pretty tough, Right. I mean, what if you had to walk to Tulsa, then walk to Oklahoma City, then walk to Dallas? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To preach the gospel. And then they beat you. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's pretty tough. That's a pretty tough run, right? I think. Um, and, you know, if you were to walk from here to Tulsa, which I don't know. I've never really thought the logistics of that. But could you walk from here to Tulsa in a day? Is that a possibility? or probably two days right what do you generally walk about three mile an hour something like that huh three to five so you figure you would walk three miles if you walk three to five mile an hour 10 hour a day it's only 30 miles 30 40 miles right so a 10 hour day wouldn't get you to Tulsa so if you were going to walk to Tulsa and preach the gospel you're going to have to bed down in Glenpool for the night uh right to get to Tulsa the next day that's pretty tough, isn't it? I mean, you know, we don't think about that, do we? But that's pretty dedicated, isn't it? That's pretty dedicated to do that, I think. Um, so they, they travel all this ground, which is, which is a long ways, right? And he says, go over to Macedonia. 
So after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, uh, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, you know, we thank Paul, which we're not that far yet, but we thank Paul actually in his last missionary journey, we think he actually uh, went to Spain uh, after he was released the last time by Nero uh, before he was imprisoned and beheaded. We know he went to Crete because that's where he left Titus, but most people, most scholars believe that he went as far as Spain preaching the gospel before he actually wound up back in Rome and was beheaded by Nero. So, you know, we talk about three missionary journeys of Paul. The first one we kind of looked at wasn't so big. This one is substantially bigger. The third one is very big, winds up in Jerusalem. And then he winds up, we're going to go through that, winds up in house arrest, wind up in all that stuff happening. And then he's going to, and then he's going to go to, go to Rome. He's going to be imprisoned in Rome under Nero under house arrest. Then Nero's going to release him for about a year. Then he's going to go to Crete. We think he goes to Spain through Europe. And then he winds up back in prison by Nero in Rome, and he's beheaded by Nero. Paul traveled a lot of miles preaching the gospel, didn't he? You know, and, um, and it's just pretty astounding to uh, kind of put it in perspective. So there's a lot of things going on here that affect um, you know, there's a lot of things. It's our example. So like I said, when you go back to church split, when you go back to what actually split us, a lot of it comes back to Acts. A lot of it comes back to this very, these very passages of Scripture. How, what does God tell us we can't do? What does God tell us we can't do? Um, part of how we look at Scripture. And then, of course, when they said, well, God doesn't say we can't do a missionary society, so we can do a missionary society. And then when the instrument question came along, we use the same hermeneutic, right? God doesn't say we can't use an instrument, so let's have an instrument. The other hermeneutic was God doesn't say we can have an instrument, so we can't have an instrument. You see what I'm saying? And that hermeneutic became what governed doctrine, and that's what eventually widened that split. It all came down to that one simple basic idea. The Bible says we can do it, right? The Bible doesn't say we can't, so we can or the Bible doesn't say it, so we can't. It comes down to that one simple, one simple thing, right? And that eventually is we use that hermeneutic as we talk about music, we talk about missionary societies, we talk about church governance, church leadership, we talk about all those things. We use that same hermeneutic over and over and over, and the more that happens, the more we split, split, split. Remember you said they had a regional office now regional headquarters well why because the bible doesn't say we can't right but we say the bible doesn't say we can you see and gradually that division gets wider and wider and wider over time but it all comes back to that one simple simple little question it all comes back to that and then nowadays they say well the only thing that separates us from them is the instrument well that's just not true because over the years we've we've gone like that and now we have now they have women preachers, women elders, right? And the Bible doesn't say we can't, right? So our example is that it doesn't exist, but the Bible doesn't say we can't. So now we go wider and wider and wider till we're we don't look like each other at all anymore, right? Yeah, first Christian disciples in Church of Christ. We, we all started in the same place. We all started in exactly the same place, but we're certainly not in the same place today. Um, but like I say, it all comes back to that one, sur one simple, simple hermeneutic, right? Is silence authority. It all comes back to that question. It, well, it's... it's, it's <laughs> oh, I know, but I mean, that's the, that's, that's the basic question, you know. Right. <laughs> well, I think we complicate it, but, but it comes back to how you view it. I mean, if you view silence as authority, that changes how you view doctrine. If you view that silence is an authority, then it... Yeah, I know it's a deep discussion, but it still comes back to a fairly simple... I mean, it still comes back to that fairly basic 
the split in the church came back to that very basic question, really. It really came back to that. So it just depends on which side of that line you stand on, you know. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> sure. Yeah, like I said, there's a lot of deep doctrinal discussions. I mean, I probably maybe oversimplify it, but I mean, that is basically where that came from, and it came out of missionaries. I mean, it came out of missionary societies. That was the original thing, and it all came back to basically the war and the feelings they had for one another, the missionary society, and it being on the wrong side of the Mason-Dixon line, and all that is really what catalyst. That was the catalyst that drove the split, you know. That was the, that was the catalyst that started it all moving right there. So anyway, thanks for your time this evening. Yeah. <laughs>